How many are thankful to be here tonight? Amen. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. I just want to share with us a couple of scriptures that I was helped with earlier in the week as we press into the word. Indeed, it shall be a mighty delivery tonight. The book of Zechariah chapter 4, it reads at verse 1, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking. And there was a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. At verse 12 it reads, and I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. I had been in this place, in this book earlier this week and by the grace of God, I had the privilege of inquiring. And have you ever thought why the angel of the Lord had the posture that he had towards Zechariah saying, wait up, you don't know what this is? And as I spoke with the man of God earlier this week, what was brought to me was that sometimes in the presence of God, we can have a posture that even the angels themselves think we know already. And I want to encourage us tonight to receive a fresh discernment and to ask questions. Now, by the grace of God, we give God praise for the meat that is delivered here, meeting after meeting. And so as we're chewing on that word, just naturally, we're gonna ask questions. You see, but I want us to be encouraged to not be familiar in that area, things that you've heard, things that we have been reminded of in scriptures and in encounters, because there will always be something that we can draw from it because we know we are in a great season of visitation. And let us draw all that we can from these encounters that we will have by the grace of God, by his mercy, by his love for us and him revealing what's to come. Amen? God is good. Let's stand in the presence of God. Father, we say that there is none like you. And we know by faith that you see this meeting for indeed it is your meeting. And Lord, as we pray unto thee, as we come before you humbly, O oh God, we say, have your way tonight. Have your way tonight, oh God, and move in our midst. Lord, grant unto us a heart of discernment. Lord, that we not miss your touch, that we not miss you visiting our hearts and our minds, oh God, as we press on, knowing that we have grown in awareness, knowing that we are not alone, that you are with us even until the end of the age, oh God, and that you have brought us to an innumerable company of your angels, of just men made perfect. Our spirits shall inquire tonight. We shall inquire, we shall receive, we shall experience understanding and revelation afresh tonight to bring glory to your name for the edification of the body. Lord, we thank you for this vessel, this man of God. As he pours out,
pour into him, oh God, and be glorified in this ministration tonight. Let us welcome this mighty man of God, the prophet Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you. Awesome. Please be seated. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. God is good. Oh, wow, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All righty. So great to be here. And one of the things that I would love to do today is to actually help us to have a reflection on the goodness of God that affords us the privilege of being able to gather as we are doing right now. I'm sure there are several people here today when leaving your home or wherever you took off from. You told whoever you were leaving behind that you were going to church. And you didn't have to lie. You didn't have to hide. You didn't have to pretend like you were going somewhere and you just happened to be here. That freedom and the liberty that we have still to be able to say that I am going to the house of God is more worth celebrating than many of us are aware of. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that we do know is that Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And by the time Noah was building the ark and getting ready to receive the judgment of God upon the disobedient, he was or he had become the super minority. He had become the super minority. History tells us that there was only one other person who was really evangelizing alongside with the man Noah, and that was Methuselah. And that was the reason why Methuselah, I believe, lived longer than everybody else, because all the ones that were his contemporaries were taken by God, the ones who were faithful, because God did not want them to be made subject to any form of what you would call drawback. You know, in the last days, the Bible says, there shall be a great apostasy which means many will fall from faith. Many will fall from not just grace, but they will depart from the faith. You know, I tell people that it was not the, Jesus did not command us to keep money or to keep people. He commanded us to keep the faith. And you know, isn't it interesting that so many people have allowed the faith to slip because of money? Many people have allowed their confidence in God to slip because of people. The reality of it is that no matter what it is that you have once held dear and in high esteem, ensure that nothing takes preeminence over your ability to continue to believe unto the saving of your soul. Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's a privilege to be here. And we'll, we'll take a quick look at two scriptures just to get us started. Daniel chapter 12. We have quoted from it quite a bit lately. And now I just want us to read Daniel chapter 12. The book of Daniel is in the Old Testament. And if you forgot that, it means you need to spend a bit more time with the Bible. Praise the Lord. So Daniel chapter 12. And I would like to read from verse 1. It says... At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. The word stand watch there is not just to be an overseer. It's not just to be a protector. But to stand watch means to intercede, to be an intercessor for. The one that stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, was since there was a nation. A time of trouble that has never been since we've had nations. And that is the reason why when John was being presented the same scroll that Daniel received, he said, this is the great tribulation. Because the description and the footnotes that were in the scroll of Revelation that was delivered to him included such declaration that this is such a tribulation as we have never seen. Now, someone says, um, we look forward to the time, Brother Moses, that you're going to be saying nice things more consistently and not just accidentally. Because some people think that I'm always coming with, oh, the message of, oh, tribulation is coming, this and that. And, but the reality of it is that in the times that we live in, a remembrance 
of what is coming and what has already begun is actually good news. Oh yes, Revelation chapter 18 verse 20 tells us that it is good news. That when we see the calamity of that beast system called Mystery Babylon, when we see it happen, we would notice that the merchants from the east will raise their voices and wail because of the financial loss that they would suffer. The Bible says they will lift up their voices and weep and say, who will continue to buy our merchandise? But what does the word of God say concerning you and I? He says, but let the saints rejoice. Simply because it is inevitable for the great tribulation to come. If it doesn't come, then your redemption does not come. Because God does not change his mind about his plan. And the plan that he's running right now, is the same, that he's executing now, is the same plan that he's been running since the beginning. Because he changes not. I was sharing with our men this morning while we were having our monthly breakfast. Oh, you're calling the things that be not as though they were. I know we've not had it every month in recent times, but now we have received the revival. We're back at it. Oh, yes, and no matter what happens, we will continue that fellowship. We had some of the most amazing times today. And it wasn't just because Chris was there. It was just because it was sweet fellowship in the Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. So I thought I'd say that quickly before, you know, someone else tries to take credit. You know, but Chris was kind of like our moderator today, you know. He was, you know, moderating and then Antoine was, you know, the guest minister. He was, he was, he was phenomenal. We had, we had an, an awesome time of fellowship and Brother Shane was the champion of second service. After everybody left, he was like, excuse me, I have a question. And that was because he didn't know me. Because whenever you say you have a question, be ready for another service. Because I live for things like that. You know, you say you have a, well, Kayla, you're agreeing a little too much. What's going on? <laughs> when I say I live for things, like I just like, oh, yeah. And so we, we have to go over these things again because it is not what is happening that matters as much as how you see it. You see, because some people will look at all of the things that are going on and see them as the work of Satan and, and focus on how powerless the, the witnesses have become in the face of opposition and then become despondent. Whereas we are not supposed to see it that way. You know, the Bible says that when Satan was released from the bottomless pit, he came back to earth. And he was so angry, he was mad. He raised an army in an attempt to go to Zion to take his vengeance out on the resurrected saints, the saints of the first resurrection. But by the time he got there, as he was getting close, the Bible says that fire came from heaven and consumed himself and the, and the goons that he had summoned. He had gone to the four corners of the earth and incited the kings of the earth, which was a replay of what he did in heaven when he was able to convince a third of the angels to come after him. He had a replay of that on the earth, but he failed. And then after that, what happened? He resumed the next phase of his ministry, which was to deceive the nations. And one of the things he did to ensure that the great deception results in the great tribulation was to give power to the beast. He gave power to the beast. And so we need to be conversant of what is going on. Because when the Bible says that Satan gave his power to the beast and that the beast now had enough power to overcome the saints. I'm sure some people here may just be hearing that for the first time. But it's right there. Revelations 13, Revelations 16, 17, 18. You see the power of the beast. In fact, when you read Revelation 11, you will also see where the two witnesses were being described. And the Bible says that there came a beast from the abyss and he was able to overpower the two witnesses that are the two lamb stands in the presence of God. The two olive trees that are in the presence of God representing the children of Abraham and the redeemed Gentile church by the blood of the lamb. The Bible says the beast from the abyss will overpower them. And when you hear things like that, you're like, Wow, okay, maybe John did not understand what the angel of the Lord was saying because the Bible says that we are the overcomers. And so when you look through the eyes of the world system, the way things run in the world, when you look, and God forbid that you would even look through the eyes of your flesh, through a carnal mindset, 
what you will find is hopelessness, is despondency, and because the powers that be do not want us to attain such resilience in the spirit, they systematically keep those things away from sermons that are approved by authorities. Because when you hear things like that, it sends you to your spiritual gym to begin to lift weights because you know that there is a beast that is coming. That is not just going to torment the saints, but the Bible says we'll overcome the saints. But the way God wants us to see such experiences, the way God wants us to interpret or to interpret those things when we read them is to see that overcoming of the saints as the privilege for us to have an encounter of a different kind of resurrection power. There is only one resurrection power and that is the Holy Spirit. But when I say different kind of resurrection power, it means we're going to have a different experience of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says that after the beast from the abyss came to the surface and he took care of business by shutting down the gospel, he shut down the two witnesses. And for three days, the Bible says that their bodies were scattered all over the city that sits upon the seven hills. And then the Holy Spirit got the memo. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit came down once again and came into these witnesses that have been wasted and brought them to life again. And that was the resurrected life that they can never lose again. The second resurrection immunes you to not just the second death, but to any kind of death. Because after that happened, the Bible says that death was no more. And so when we hear of tribulation and when we hear of the church being forced to go underground, when we hear of the army that is coming from the north, when we hear of the beast that is coming from the abyss, we're not supposed to be threatened, we're not supposed to be afraid, not even when we hear that our gospel will be shut down and that the witnesses will be no more. When we hear those things, we're not afraid because we know that there is a joy that is set before us. Imagine Jesus being afraid because he was going to the cross. The Bible says what Jesus saw was quite terrifying. He saw what was ahead. He was like, uh, is it too late to kind of like rewrite this tale? He said, if you will, can this cup pass over me? He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Why did he say that? We were told later on that he said that because of the joy that was set before him, not the torment that was immediate. The reason why many people will back out of the faith, the reason why the apostasy will sweep many away is because they are getting obsessed with the torment that is and getting obsessed with the tribulation that is to be rather than projecting beyond through the instrumentation of prophecy to the joy that is set before them, which is another visitation of the Holy Spirit. Heaven doesn't dish out power when it is not required. It's like if I shut down all the power that is in this business park and feed it to just this television, you know what's going to happen? It's going to blow up because that is more power than it can handle. So what do you do when you want more power? You introduce more load. I, I sometimes laugh when I see Christians begging for the kind of experience that Peter, James, and John had, begging for the experience of people like Apostle Paul. I'm like, be careful what you ask for, because for such power to be delivered, such pain has to be experienced. But we have to be ready for it, because I do not want to live and enter into the resurrection without having, without having experienced that kind of power. And that is the reason why we need to begin to school ourselves in the heart of repentance to be highly expectant of deep trouble and great tribulation so that we will build the capacity to be able to go out smiling like Stephen did while he was being stoned to death. The Bible says that when that man of God was being stoned to death, death the very first matter, what happened was he opened his eyes and the Bible says the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ giving him a standing ovation to receive him into glory. What a way to go. But here we are, they are telling us that there will be a rapture before the rupture. No, no, no. The next time they say that, ask them to show you in scripture where it says, because all the Bible says is that we are going to overcome and for you to overcome, there has to be opposition. And the description of the tribulation is very clear. The Bible says that when the tribulation begins, many will fall at your right hand and 10,000 at your left hand. So it's not just going to be something you behold from above. It's something that you experience all around. 
I always tell people, if God is too afraid of what Satan is bringing to quickly sneak you out through the back door, then I don't want to go to that kind of God. I want to go to the God that can keep me even in the midst of trouble. I want to go to a God whose promise of putting a seal on the saints is enough for me to observe the four men of the apocalypse right by and I turn around and I praise Jesus. Because he is able to keep you in this world. Eternity will be such a risk if we do not have a full assurance that God is able to keep us through the highest of tsunamis. If we, are, if we do not have proof that God can keep us through the greatest tribulation there is, then why do you want to risk being in eternity with that God? And that is the reason why God is allowing all of these things to happen so that our heads can be correct. So that we can be calibrated right to have a value system that recognizes the full extent of your heavenly father's power. Has he done it before? Yes. Is that what he does? Yes. In Exodus, I told you, Pharaoh was almost about to let the children of Israel go just because Moses was such a diplomat. You know, he, was, he grew up in the palace. He knew those boys. He knew the way that they operated. The Bible did not say that all the people that were in his time of the palace had died. The Bible says only the ones who wanted to kill him died. So when he returned, the people that were still there, who were in the corridors of power, were the boys that he grew up with in the palace, the ones who did not wish his death. Because God did not send him there to settle an old score. God sent him there to start a new regime. You know, that is the reason why so many of us in the body of Christ today have not experienced the power. Simply because if God gives you the power right now, you want to settle old scores. There are exes you want to kill. There are neighbors that you want to just, you just want to stand and wink and then have one of your arms fall off. And then you go, and you go to them and say, next time you're not going to insult a child of God. Yeah, so God is not releasing the power until we have a very clear vision of a true opposition. Because right now, many of us, we think that our brothers and sisters are the enemies. And God is not going to accidentally give you a loaded weapon because then you're going to start shooting spouses and shooting children and shooting pastors and shooting neighbors. You see, and God is like, they are not the enemy. Wait until the real enemy comes out and then you can empty your barrel. Let me tell you something. You know, the Bible is very detailed. In Revelations, the Bible says that the beast from the abyss will not be able to overpower the witnesses until they have emptied out the power within them. The Bible says until all of their power is complete, which means until they have expended all their power, they will not be, no one can overcome them. And so you know what it means? What it means is that God wants us to clean out whatever we have right now to make room for the new that he is bringing because Jesus says, behold, I come. My reward is with me and I make all things new. And that is the reason why the tribulation is good news for us because it is sanitization. It is helping to clean out the old completely so that we can be full candidates of the new, not having any carryover of wickedness into the new Jerusalem. And so now that you know, you are no longer afraid and you shouldn't be of the beast that is coming from the abyss. Because when the Bible says that he's coming to take out the witnesses, what he's coming to do is coming to clean the mess because these guys are completely done. We need to learn how to rejoice. It is important. One of the things that the Lord's made abundantly clear is that he will reward our obedience. And one of the things that the Lord expects us to obey is every word that proceeds from his mouth. So when the Lord says rejoice, again I say rejoice. He's not just talking about rejoice when Sister Z comes to give a testimony of how now some project has paid millions into our account. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> you see, that was rejoicing. I want to see more of that attitude when I tell you that there is a beast coming from the abyss. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not convinced. <laughs> but good news is we're getting there. Hallelujah. Let's get into some more good news. The Bible says that even up until that time, there had never been such a tribulation. Daniel chapter 12, I'm still reading from verse 1. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Isn't it interesting that the people were not delivered until the tribulation became the 
the most or the, the, uh, the most intense ever. God does things like that. He, he doesn't, you see, he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is. And, and when you look at what he did, I told you, Pharaoh was almost going to let the children of Israel go. He said to Moses, he was like, actually, I, I, don't, I personally don't have a problem with you letting them go. I mean, I'm not my ancestors. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the one who put you in the situation that you're in. He says, so I'm, I'm quite happy to let you go. You understand what I mean? He says, but maybe at the beginning, let's see what three days looks like. Let's see what three days looks like. You understand what I mean? And when God saw that, God was like, wait a minute. That's a little too easy. Because now if I bring all my guns, I would look like a bully. Because now I'm bringing my guns to someone who's got one arm behind his back. And the other one is holding a little piece of stick that cannot even become a serpent without his magicians. So why will then, what will be my reason? So he said to Moses, he says, look, uh, go, go home and come back. Before Moses came back the next day, Pharaoh's heart had become hardened. And Moses, just like you and I, went back to God and said, um, excuse me, your promise is that we will continue making progress. This looks like we're retrogressing. You know how many times you think like that? We all think like that. Because we, we fail to see in those moments as God sees. You know, there are times when you're like, oh my goodness, I thought this thing was over. I thought things were getting better. And then it, it seems to now get worse. Let me tell you something. God's word is always true no matter how it feels in your body. You know, the Bible says that the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. And so whenever you think that there is darkness replacing the little light that you saw yesterday, that is not a real darkness. That is just a bad vision. Just clean your eyes and see through his. Moses thought that things were going bad. He was like, oh, this is not good. This guy nearly let us go yesterday, nearly. And God was like, that's the reason why his heart is hardened today. He said, that was me. I have hardened his heart so that I can then bring out my outstretched arm. God is like, I want them to see my hand in your deliverance. You know, because when it looks like you got that job because your uncle knows the CEO, even if you really want to give glory to God, you still reserve a lot of the credit for the man who sent your resume. Or who actually just made a phone call. You know those jobs that you get without sending your resume, they're the best. Because expectation is X, is a variable. They're not looking at the resume, they just bring you in. But God doesn't want that. When it comes to your deliverance, when it comes to, you know, what we call the showers of blessings or the drizzles, things like that can happen. But God says, I want to be able to bring out my outstretched arm because I have partners that are invested in your deliverance and they have to be needed so that they don't feel excluded. One of God's partners in your deliverance is the mightiest angel ever to exist. And his name is Michael. And the name Michael is a description of the power of God because it means who is like God. So when you see him, what will hit you in your heart is that if God made this one, there is no one like God. Michael is a partner in your deliverance. And the other angels who are lower in rank will not let Michael get up and go to battle if it's something that they can handle. So while it is still something that those angels can handle, they do not summon Michael. Can I prove that to you? Remember this same Daniel. Had, because he was a politician, right? He was, he was a special advisor to the Chaldeans, who were pretty much the ones who ran the cabinet of Nebuchadnezzar. And so, when, so because sometimes we don't think about what it means for someone to be a, a chief counsel to the Chaldeans. I mean, we're talking about the people who were regarded as the, the geniuses of their time. But when, they, when Daniel encountered them, 
their description actually changed from just being the Chaldeans, they became the Magi. Because remember, the Magi were the ones that we called the wise men who came and said we had seen his star in the east. When you trace the history of the Magi, they schooled under the administration of Daniel, 490 plus years prior. So this man was someone who was very strategic. And so he had gone to God with a strategy for defeating the council of the principality that was over the region. And God was like, this is brilliant. Let's grant Daniel what he's asking for. But the prince of Persia was like, there's no way you can deliver this. The moment you deliver this, I'm toast. You're about to take the region from me. So that principality rose up and withstood the angel that remains forever nameless. At least maybe not forever, at least for now, nameless. Because that the name of that angel was not mentioned. And that angel was withheld by a principality. A principality which stood an angel that was coming from the presence of God. That is the reason why sometimes we cannot just wage war, or we shouldn't. The Bible says, by wisdom, wage war. We need to obtain spiritual or what I like to call heavenly intelligence when it comes to spiritual warfare. Otherwise we will see certain things in the realm of the spirit because just imagine if God reveals to you that this angel is leaving the presence of God and bringing your blessing. That would be the end of your fast. You're going to stop fasting. You're going to put your feet up. If anybody talks to you, they have to put a title before your name. If they don't say apostle, you don't answer. Do you not know that there's an angel, not even half an angel, a whole angel with wings that has been sent to me. What's your name again? That is how people begin to behave. But if you do not truly know what you're dealing with, that which you have the privilege of seeing may actually not be enough to deliver what God has for you. And because God does not want to overwhelm you with his power, he gives you what you ask for just so that you can recognize that you, uh, you didn't ask enough. Oh yeah, those things happen. That's how we grow. You know, because if everything you try works, you will never learn. So what happened was this angel came and the prince of Persia was able to withstand the angel for 21 days. This was not just a, an easy battle. This was a serious war. And when that angel of the Lord saw that he wasn't getting anywhere with the prince of Persia, he sent for backup. He phoned home. And that was when Michael came. What did we learn from that experience? I, per, I believe and that experience was detailed in scripture so that we know that in the hierarchy of the angels of war, there is so much regard for the superior angels that you don't just bother them unless it's about to be over for you. That angel did not phone home two hours after engaging the prince of Persia. Not two days. Not ten days. Twenty-one days he fought until he was like, okay, at this particular point in time, if I page Michael, he, he would know that I have tried. You see where, my, where I'm going with this? So for someone like Michael to be involved in what we are going through, that will lead to the redemption of our souls, it has to be justified. God doesn't bring out his biggest guns until it is time for the biggest battles. These are the reasons why I am super excited to continue to teach on anticipating tribulation. We've had enough people. In fact, I believe, and this is, I mean, you can debate, but I believe that we have enough people in the church teaching people how to anticipate a new car, a new job, a new spouse. A new, there is enough of that. But I don't think we have enough people teaching us how to anticipate what we actually need to prepare for. A lot of what we're anticipating have already been prepared for us and we are being prepared for them. But the ones that we have to be intentional about preparing for are completely left out because Satan knows that if we can somewhat be prepared, they have more work to do. So things have to be this deadly for Michael to arise. And the Bible says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, this is verse 2, shall awake some to everlasting life. 
some to shame. Where am I reading? Because I'm reading it by heart. Am I on the right page? Oh yeah. And she has some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there will be a resurrection. Simply because of the powers that will come to the earth. You know? Uh, the way resurrection works, we saw a demonstration of it in the life of Elisha. You know that after Elisha died and was buried and his entire flesh had decayed, many years later, he had become bones. Somebody was being buried next to him. And the lazy goons who were burying him could not lower him properly because it's like no one sees us. Who cares? They just tossed him into the, into the pit. You know, sometimes when people are being careful, careless with your life, they're actually setting you up for a deliverance. When people are being reckless about the way they treat you, the way they handle you, you know when God says you are his anointed and you are his beloved, and so people think that they can just toy with you, they do not know that they are setting you up to encounter a kind of power that will then put all of their efforts to shame and give all the glory to God. And so sometimes when people are mishandling you, don't be mad. Just be expectant. The men that could have been lowered with dignity, do you know tradition requires for them to wrap the man? Because these were Jewish people. They were supposed to have wrapped him, but they couldn't be bothered to wrap the man. Almost every other burial that you see of Jewish, of, 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 Jew, of, of, of people in the Bible required for linen to be about the body of the dead. And then when you're extremely poor and you cannot afford the linen strips, you wrap them in a bundle. But whatever you do, wrap them. So if he was properly wrapped, do you think his arm would have been able to fly over to another grave? No. The Bible says they put him in there as so they were shoving him in. His arm moved and hit the bones of Elisha. And the man came to life again. Because the resurrection power is eternal. Elijah was the one who said that the power of God was shot in his bones. Was that not proven? Because those bones still raised the man from the dead. And so because some people say, well, if, you, if God already knows that that person that died that is in the ground is not worthy because of the fact that they have not received the love of God and responded by faith to his invitation, and if they have not chosen him, why is he allowing them to be raised in the first place? Because I was one of those people, I used to think you have to be super righteous by the blood of the Lamb for you to be raised from the dead. But then apparently, the resurrection power is in a way no respecter of persons. The kind of power that heaven will bring at the sounding of the trumpet is no respecter of persons. Some unrighteous people will accidentally be raised from the dead. And when they get raised from the dead, they will be judged and found to be worthy of nothing but shame and contempt. And their souls and bodies will be destroyed in hell. Have you ever wondered why does Jesus say, do not be afraid of the one that can destroy the body, but be afraid of the one that can destroy both the soul and the body in hell? Because in my mind, I've always thought only the righteous will receive a new body at the resurrection. So why would anybody's body need to be destroyed in hell when it's already decayed in the ground? And the reason is because some people People will rise up just because Michael is coming. <laughs> you see, when I say Michael is coming, you have to understand that Jesus is coming too. And the Holy Spirit is coming too. Now, the three manifestations of power that we have seen that all culminate in the one that is called the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the Lord Jesus Christ, are coming to the earth at the same time. No dead bodies don't stand a chance. They will rise. So, but at resurrection, there will be a separation. Some shame and contempt, but some will be given glory. Simply because by the time they are raised from the dead, there will be a match between their spirit and the resurrection power. That's why the Bible says the spirit bears witness with your spirit. 
But if you are raised from the dead just because there is so much electricity coming from heaven and there is no resonance or there is no witness, there is no spirit in you, which means you are not born again, guess what? They will take you and that new body that you have been raised with and destroy you in hell. Does that, does that make sense? So these are the things that will play out on the day. Many will rise from the dust simply because they are close to the circumference of power. Can I tell you one more thing about the way God operates and this event, this thing that was described in Daniel chapter 12 nearly happened in, in Exodus 19. In, Ex, in Exodus 19, let, let, me show, let me show you something that we just read that we didn't really dwell on. So when you look at what we just read, the Bible says everyone who is found in the book will be delivered. Everyone who is found in the book. I just want to make that clear so that we understand the criteria for selecting the resurrect for the criteria for separation at resurrection. It is those who are found in the book. Why is this important? Satan is currently executing a plan through the ministry of the false prophet and the beast, the Antichrist. And that is to change the assets that God has on the earth so that their configuration no longer matches what God has in his books. Everything that comes into existence was already written in the book of God's, the book of life. There is a book of life which represents everybody that God has made, all the assets that he put on the earth that Jesus calls in his parable, wheat. And then Satan came through the ministry of the watchers and created hybrid people who also live on the earth. Remember that in the time of Noah, one of the biggest problems was that the children that were the product of the affair of the watchers and the daughters of men, they became giants on the earth, men of renown. They became the celebrities. They became the, the important quote-unquote people in the society. And Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be again in the days of the son of man. And one of the things that the enemy is banking on, if you've seen the Avengers, you will know that Satan and his goons still believe that they can overcome the eternal plan of God that is called Thanos. You know what Thanos means? That which is eternal. So they still think that they can defeat the eternal counsel of God. And because of the fact that they believe they can, they want to raise for themselves their own chosen people. Because Satan, according to what God revealed to Ezekiel, has an ultimate plan to replicate everything that Jesus did. He says, I will arise. Jesus was risen. He says, I will go up. Jesus was called up to the right hand of the Father. He says, and I will make my throne next to the Almighty. And then unto me shall the congregation of the people come. And he knows that if he's going to have people come to him in the large number that he imagines because he is so envious of the Lord Jesus Christ, he may have to make some of his own people. And so now let me tell you why that is important. Because there was nothing made that was made without the word. He can only take that which the word has made and corrupt it so that it is no longer acceptable by the Lord. And that's why when you read in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that some who take those, not some, who take the mark of the beast, the ones who accept it into their bodies. The Bible says, what about them? The Bible says that their names were then deleted, removed from the book of life. May we not have our names removed from the Lamb's book of life. Because some people will be resurrected, but there will be things found in them that has changed the configuration that heaven recognizes. And when there is a mismatch, they strike the match. It's the fire of hell straight away. That is the reason why we will not bow to the beast. The only way our heads are going to touch the ground anywhere close to the feet of the beast would be if they cut it off like they did to John the Baptist. But as long as we live, we will bow to no one but the one who is the maker of all things. Let me tell you something. The things that I am telling you are not 50 years away. The things that I am telling you are closer than you think. That was why Jesus 
that, that's why Apostle Paul, he said that the coming of the Lord would be as a thief in the night to those who are without. He says, but for you, I don't have to tell you because you already know. Why was he saying that? Because he was talking to the same people who had imbibed the culture of praying without ceasing. He said, because you already know. He said, but for the people who are not paying attention to the gospel that we preach, the ones who are not paying attention to the word that he prophesied. You know, Paul prophesied the war that is happening right now in the Ukraine. He said, when they say peace and safety, their destruction will come. What announced the war in Ukraine? The presentation of that beast, the image of the beast that was given to the United Nations. What was the name of that beast that was presented by the angels of the South? It was called peace and security. That was what, late 2021 thereabouts? And as soon as that happened, the Lord notified me of what had just happened. Because you know me, sometimes the news can be, the, can be news in, but this is more current. So I'm going to stick with the prophetic. And when the Lord showed to me what had just happened, he told me the story in the names of what was being presented. He says, look at the names of the people, the couple that presented the image to the United Nations. And do you know what their name, both of them, their names mean angel in different languages. And it was like, those are my messengers. He said, because that thing is that which I said will be a gift that will be presented to the Lord, placed in the abominable place. What is the abominable place? A place that has a name of abomination. This is called the house of God because it has the name of God. It's called Bethel because the, the name of God is in this place. When we gather unto his name, he is there with us. And so when there is abomination in the place, it, it is because an abominable place is there. And what is an abominable name? A name that God says must not exist, but people have figured out a way to make it exist. The Bible says in Genesis 11 that God came down, that the Elohim came down and said, as long as these people remain one, all the evil intents of their hearts, they will be able to perpetrate. So from this moment onwards, we forbid that they will be one. They have to be different speech, different tongue, different people. That was the plan of God in Genesis 11. Simply because we had not reached that age of maturity or we have not even received the righteousness that allows for us to be able to handle such a power. The biggest or the most potent power available to man is unity. If we're united, that is the most power. And it was proven to us in Acts of Apostles. The Holy Spirit has been waiting, waiting, waiting to come. Because when Jesus says, if you pray to the Father, he will send you the Holy Spirit. And he was taken up to the heavens. He says, go and wait for me until you have received power from on high. There were 500 people. And the Holy Spirit was checking in. And it was like, I cannot come because there is no resonance. The frequency that I am waiting to possess has to be a frequency of unity. But these 500 people that saw Jesus being taken up, even though they all want to wait for him to come, they're not united. So the Holy Spirit kept waiting until they became 490, 300, 250. And the Holy Spirit is still like, there, is, there are people there that are not really there. The Holy Spirit was pointing out to the Father people who were there to sell merchandise. The Holy Spirit was pointing to people who were there just because of some selfish interest. They're not there in anticipation of the power. They are there because they want someone to notice them. I say, look at me. I'm here. <laughs> I'm one of you people. You understand what I mean? And the Holy Spirit, as long as that was going on, he couldn't come, not because he didn't want to, but it was just because for the most potent capacity to be obtained, there has to be unity. But praise the Lord, there was a day that was called the day of Pentecost even though there were only 120 of them in the place, the Holy Spirit was like, it is either now or never. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were together in one place and in one accord. That unity that is the recipe for ultimate potency was attained and the Holy Spirit was able to fill them. So going back to Genesis 11, God forbade that people should be united. Come back to John chapter 17. Jesus gave an exception. You know, God says people should no longer be one. Let them be different nations. Let them be different tribes. Let them speak different languages. And we're going to keep it that way because they can't handle that much more power. They cannot handle power that is beyond that. So Jesus knew 
that for them to receive the Holy Spirit, they need to be able to come into unity, but the Father already forbade it. So he made an exception in John chapter 17. He says, sanctify them by, the, by your truth. Your word is truth. So after they've been sanctified by the truth, they received immunity that will preserve them from disobeying the Almighty God. He now said, Father, now make them one as we are one. And the only exception that was given to any people to be one is if they are one in Christ. So when a group of men came together in 1945 and they said that they were going to become one, they chose a name that means one. The word UN might be an acronym to you, but to the ones who formulated it is a word in French that means one. <clears throat> that was long-winded, but much needed. Because when the Bible says that they took it to the abominable place and they said the name of that statue, which was the same image that uh, John saw. You know that that image used to be three beasts. When Daniel saw them, he saw the leopard, he saw the bear, and he saw the lion. There were three different beasts, right? Even though there was a fourth. But when, what's his name? Our dear beloved brother John, when John saw them, they had come together. Now let me explain what happened there because it was recently that the Lord took me into a study that allowed for me to actually see the merging together of the three beasts, three of the four that Daniel saw. How were they able to merge together? They were able to merge together because of a connecting glue that was a spirit that used to be an individual operating spirit, Jezebel. You know, Jezebel used to be in the palace. But by the time the message of the Lord came to the angels of the church, where was Jezebel? The Bible says Jezebel was now in the church. And so those beasts were able to mer merge into one. The feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, and the head of a lion. And it was given the wings of a bird. I wish we, we, we had that image prepared. I would have shown you on the screen today just to refresh your memory. And the Bible says that death and Hades will not be too far away. How many people remember seeing that image at the Rockefeller Center, the UN building when they presented that image late 2021? Do you remember that when they presented it on one of those days, they put the image of death behind that image? A skeleton was in that image, just like John the Apostle describes it, that death and Hades will be in the wake. So I tell you these things to let you know that the particular war that we are seeing in the Ukraine was the one prophesied by Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians. When he said, chapter 5, that when you see them say peace and safety, he says, then their destruction will come and it will be as the pangs of a woman in labor. Why am I telling you all of that? I'm telling you all of that because Michael is getting ready. The Lord Jesus is getting ready. The Holy Spirit is getting ready. And they are not coming until the cup of wickedness is full. They're not coming until this privilege that we enjoy today of being able to come together openly is no more. Until our numbers dwindle down in proportion to what the numbers of Noah and Methuselah were compared to the rest of the population that perished in the flood. The Almighty God has one commitment and that is not to come and save everybody but he has a commitment to save only the remnants of the people. But nobody's telling us that because they want to keep us in the way that leads to destruction. Jesus says broad is the way and easy. Broad and easy is the way. That's a very common combination today. What are people looking for today? They're looking for easy experience. If you go to a church and you have to park two streets away, oh, that's not easy. If the man of God is not saying things that you can fall asleep to, that's not easy. I mean, that, you see, people are looking for teachers that will say what they want to hear. Teachers that will promise a revival that will never come to pass. 
Teachers that will promise the election of a political leader that will never happen. People are looking to present to you a savior that does not bear in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says Jesus himself speaking. He says many will come in my name. He says, but by their fruits you shall know them. Let me tell you something. When you see people idolize another person and say to you that he can do no wrong, they have put him in the place of the one who is called the prince of righteousness run very quickly before you get destroyed in their companionship but that is what people want because the bible says broad and easy is the way that leads to destruction but narrow and difficult is the way that leads to life but guess what that which is called difficult you need to develop an appetite for it until it becomes sweet in your mouth when the prophecy of what is to come was given to the man of God, what did he say? He said it was bitter in my belly. It was sweet when I was eating it, but it was bitter when it got into my belly. I tell you what, we need to develop an appetite that will make the bitter thing sweet because we are not like them. We're supposed to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Completely different appetite. We can no longer be sweet tooth. But there is good news. I was telling you, and I'm going to wrap up on this hopefully, that this has happened before, just so that you know that I'm not telling you to anticipate anything that is inconsistent with the way your father operates. When Moses was called by God in Exodus chapter 19, God said to Moses, he says, tell your people to, to meet me at Sinai or Sinai. He said, but we have a lot of, we have a couple of things that have to be in place, the protocol. He says, the protocol the most critical thing, even if you do nothing else, the most critical thing is you need to barricade the foot of the mountain so that the particular mountain that I am descending on, no one can touch that mountain. He said, that's it. And then y'all come meet with me. And he said, by the way, let everybody at least have a bath. God said, let them wash themselves. Let them have a bath. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I, like the, I like the timing of that. And he says a trumpet will sound. He says when the trumpet sounds, get ready. And the moment the trumpet sounded, the Bible says there was a loud noise that was heard and was like a rushing mighty wind and lots of thunder at the same time and it came upon the mount of Sinai and the Bible says God forbade them to touch the mountain and I asked the Holy Spirit I said but why did you say not to touch the mountain he said because that is the same trumpet that is going to blow in the last days when you are sucked up to receive your new bodies he said if any one of them had touched that mountain they would have been sucked up because that is heaven's protocol he says, and God was not ready to have them burnt in hell just yet. Because by that time, they had not attained righteousness because they were living in unbelief. So if they had touched that mountain and they had gotten sucked up, they would have been transfigured. They would have received new bodies that can no longer die. And someone says, Brother Moses, what if I put it to you that that is a stretch? I will put it to you that I have proof. Because after God says none of them should come to the top of the mountain, he made an exception for Moses. He says Moses could come to the top of the mountain. When Moses got to the top of the mountain, what happened to him when he came back down? He had received a new body. He received a body that could no longer die <laughs> by the time he came down his eyes were, were glowing and the Bible says that as a man of 120 years old his stature was that of a man in his mid 30s or early 40s his posture was not bent and he could see things so far away they said his eyes was not dim the expression the eye not being dim means to be able to see a different horizon to other people you know, when you and I stand at the end of the road, we both see equal kind of horizon where the road tends to become one, right? And that's not because the earth is a ball. It's because our eyes are limited. It's called parallax. So when you look, you can only see so far. The Bible says the eyes of Moses was not dim. That means he was, not be, he was able to see even much further because the lights coming into his eyes no longer taper off at an end. The man had received a new body. So precious that God had to send Michael to come and retrieve that body after God put him into stasis, into temporary sleep. I tell you all of that to say, folks, that what is ahead of you is a joyful thing. 
But if you don't see the joy, you may cower at the temptation and the trouble that is coming ahead. And one of the things that the Bible says would allow for each and every one of us to be immune to the contempt and the shame is to come together regardless of the opposition. The Bible says do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. Especially as you see the day approaching. Let us read that verse in Hebrews chapter 10. Because I've been here and I've been pleading with you and begging you and saying to you that Satan has desired to sift some of us as wheat. Satan wants to pull us away before the Lord Jesus comes. He wants to pull you away from the place where you have been equipped. He wants to get you discouraged for one reason or the other. He wants your heart to become despondent. He wants you to sustain offense so that when there is offense in your heart, you can no longer levitate into the cloud of glory. Because the weight of offense will become bitterness in you and bitterness is that rock that is not porous. But many people are still allowing Satan to cheat them of their eternal destiny. But I pray for you that you will be one of those people who keep their hands on the plow without looking back. For Jesus says, if you look back, my soul has no pleasure in you. We have been babied long enough. We have been carrying weights made out of feather. And that is the reason why we have not built muscles that allow us to look like Jesus. But Jesus says, whoever must come to me must carry his own cross. Jesus carried his own cross. He carried his own cross. He developed muscle. And if you are going to be in his stature, you need to carry the same weight that he carried so you can build the muscle that he built. So when you stand, hell will run because they don't know if it's you or Jesus and they don't want to find out. They don't want to find out. The last thing they want to find out is for them to say, do you think that might be man or leader or Jesus? And then they remind each other, remember the last thing, the last, what happened the last time you and I encountered Jesus? You want to see that again? No, thank you. That is the, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says we will possess the gates of our enemies. It says I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. Hell is ruthless, reckless, and disorderly. They will, they, they, when, when they say someone is ruthless, they will suspend every kind of order to make sure that they achieve what they want. So how are you able to possess that gate? It's because when you show up in the right stature, many Jesuses show up and they run so that you can take what is there. Remember the four lepers that ended the famine in Israel when they had been besieged by Damascus. When Syria besieged Israel and they had come to a famine where they were actually eating each other, just like we're singing in the body of Christ today. You know, the Bible says they were besieged to the point wherein they were so hungry, they started to eat one another. And it's happening in the body of Christ today. Even though we're not eating each other physically, we're eating and consuming each other emotionally. That's why the apostle says, do not bite one another. And when you bite one another, be careful for you might devour one another. And that is what we're doing today. We, are, we, we, we find it so easy to just bite other people. The lepers that God used to end that siege, the Bible says that while they were approaching the gates of the enemy, because they had come to a point wherein they no longer loved their lives unto death, they said, if we stay here, we die. But if we go, we might live. And the Bible says, as they started going, because there were lepers who tied bells around their legs so they don't accidentally come in contact with a healthy person. Ah, don't you like the way God weaves the story of salvation? The same people who have labeled you, they've called you a liar. They've called you a thief. They've given labels on you and they keep saying online that they are warning you against the public. That they're warning you against other people. They don't know that they're putting on you the bells that will sound like war in the ears of the enemy. Oh, recently some people said that they were going to tarnish my image online. Let me tell you something. Listen to me, you goons of Satan. Repent now and be converted that you might be saved, you and your household. What you have put on me are like the bells of the leper saying, don't touch this one. Don't go to his church. Don't do business with him. But the moment I take off, the army of Syria will hear the bell and it will sound to them like the host of heaven and they will leave and I will possess my possession. Shame on the workers of iniquity. Let me tell you something. This year, we ain't playing with you. Oh yeah, because some people have mistaken our silence to mean that we are not shapeshifters. We are the true shapeshifters. Because one day we are like the Lamb of God. 
And some other days we are like the lion of the tribe of Judah. And it's high time the ignorant know the difference. So that they can cease performing the works of iniquity. Let me tell you something Paul said. Paul says we're coming after you and we will do whatever it is it takes to let you know the boundaries of hell. Maybe by our aggression you might be saved from eternal doom. He said and if that doesn't work, we will go before the Lord and we will commit your soul. We will commit you into the hands of the tormentor. He said, maybe after the tormentor has made your life miserable, your soul will find humility to submit to God. He says, whatever it takes, we have to save souls. Why? Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. After Daniel saw the ones that were raised from the dead, he said, I saw some raised unto glory, some to contempt, some to shame. He said, but there were some that I saw, and by their resurrection, at resurrection, they became as bright as the stars in the firmament. They were shining like the sun. And he said, those were the ones that were soul winners. The Bible says, Daniel saw the countenance of those who won souls. Our aggression is not because we have chosen to forget that we are the meek and the lowly. Our aggression is because there is a prize and we're not missing it. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, let them put the bells on you. The Holy Spirit says they are doing you a favor that they will regret tomorrow. Just tomorrow. Amen. Hebrews, let's be clear. You know, one of the things that the Lord's done to me in the last week is... On two days, two very intense days, I was visited by the wisdom of God. And what I was shown was that the Lord has called me to be a prophet in the order of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Those two people were priests that became prophets. But you know, there are certain people that will not know that you have transitioned. They still see you as a pastor, as a priest as a gentle loving shepherd but now the Lord has ignited your tongue and it has become fire that the Bible speaks about in Revelation chapter 11 that the time is coming wherein the witnesses when they speak fire will come out of their mouths and the Lord said to me the reason why I'm doing that is because it needs to be known that you did your work he said because if you do not warn them and their destruction comes I will seek their blood from your hands he said but when you warn them and they still choose to remain sons of perdition their destruction will be made complete and your exhortation will be to my glory and that is the reason why I am letting you know if you come against me you are coming against a rock that grinds into powder. If you come against me, I am not afraid for me. I am afraid for you because I have chosen not to love my life even unto death. The Lord called me. You cannot uncall me. I am here at the assignment of heaven and you cannot do anything about it. You know, many, many weeks ago, what did I tell you? I tell you that I wish some men will know that they can only work for me. They cannot work against me because all things work together for good to those who love God are called according to his purpose. But let me tell you something because Satan is as mad as hell at what we are doing here, exposing the the, the whore of Babylon, exposing the mystery that has been the great deception by revealing the true mystery, which is the gospel. Satan is as mad as hell. You know, sometimes I come in here and I tell you that the Catholic Church is behind the great deception as an instrument in the hand of Satan. And, 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 and you think Satan hears things like that and he takes it lightly. No, but guess what he does? He looks for people that are close to you that he can use because the Bible says the man's enemies are those of his household. But let me tell you something, not this house household because this one has been purified sanctified and the ones that you see let me tell you something God says that you will do the work of sanctification he said put away from amongst you the ones that cause discord and dissension away with you and stay where you're at hopefully you will find the Lord on the outskirts <laughs> you see let me tell you something their blood is not going to be on my hands I will warn them you see, one of the greatest tricks the devil ever pulled was to convince us that we are not an army. But what are we? The Bible says no one that is at war entangles himself in the affairs of this world. We are soldiers of the cross. If Jehovah is called the man of war, you are not his if you don't think of yourself as a soldier, always ready to do battle in his name. But because we all have coffee together and speak English, like our lives depend on it, that doesn't mean we don't no longer remember who we are in Christ Jesus. Soldiers 
And we're not looking to consume you with the power. We're just looking to enlighten you adequately so you don't destroy yourself. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read from verse 19. The Bible says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from every evil conscience. Today, I would love for us to receive the body of Jesus Christ and drink his blood in remembrance of him. Just as he commanded, he says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. The Bible says it is by the sprinkling of the blood that we receive this purification. Thank you, Jesus. Most of us, we focus on one side of the communion. Because we remember that when Jesus was resurrected, all the people that he broke bread with post-resurrection, their eyes were open and they were able to see and recognize that it was him. Right on the shore and in the living room of those two disciples from Emmaus. But there is more to communion than just having a revelation of who he is. There is more to communion than having your spiritual vision activated so that you can begin to see with your third eye. And don't be afraid to use your third eye because new agers are using that terminology. The Bible says that they serve a God that they don't even know. But when the Bible says, let your eye be single, that your entire body may be full of light, God is telling you, to, you don't walk by this sight, these eyes of the flesh, that there is one eye that is given to you that is guaranteed to bring in mono light. Because when your eye is single, your entire body will be full of light. So don't let them steal the terminology from you and make you to be afraid of it. Jesus used it first, and I'm okay with that. One of the things that we're supposed to do is this. Christian, good timing. What we're supposed to do, the Bible says, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We need to have our hearts sprinkled of evil conscience. The Bible says love believes all things. If you keep suspecting others, suspicion is not discernment. Work on your discernment and give up suspicion. But some people, because they have given a throne to the spirit of fear in their hearts, fear pushes them to walk in suspicion when they can actually move in discernment. And so suspicion opens the gate of your heart to all kinds of evil consciences. When your spouse does a thing, you're like, I'm sure she did that because she doesn't want me to do this. I know what to do. (laughs) The moment you think like that, the Bible says, think evil of no one. Because love believes all things. Believe the best of one another. Because you start with one little assumption that somebody is not being sincere with you. And because it's based on your suspicion, then the devil creates a whole episode not just an episode, seasons in your mind. Episodes that become seasons. That if God would give you the privilege of stepping out of your delusionment, of your delulu, to see the construct that Satan has created, you would want to fight the devil. That how did you mess me up like this? But the Lord says you could have stopped that even at pilot you could have stopped it sprinkle your heart of and read it the bible says of evil conscience evil conscience feeds on one thing and you know what that thing is pride evil conscience feeds on pride because the bible says that in satan iniquity was found that evil conscience conscience germinated from the inside of him because of pride. The Bible says, sprinkle your heart. Let no one think of himself more highly than he ought to. But in glorious, gracious humility, let us serve one another. If they take advantage of you, let them. Jesus says, if they compel you to go a mile, go the extra mile. But one thing that you must not do is follow them into the pit when they have chosen to continue in evil conscience, 
The Bible says, do not cast your pearl before swine. Today, I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, we would allow the blood of Jesus that has been made freely available to us at the cross to sprinkle our hearts clean of evil conscience so that you will not sit down somewhere and be planning evil for another person and be celebrating that, oh, look at the evil that I planned. He's getting traction. How? You see, the Bible says love does not rejoice in wrong. And when you see people celebrating wrong, they're no longer walking in love. Satan has had his way with them. Let that not be your testimony. I say the things that I say with, with more emphasis now because there are people that we have had an opportunity to teach for years and yet they have failed to bear fruits. And when our Heavenly Father uprooted them, they started crying foul. But at the end of the day, it is not how who uprooted you. It was your lack of fruitfulness that caused the hand of God to pluck you out so that you do not pollute another. May you not be removed from the garden of the Lord. The intention of God is for you to remain a tree that is planted in the house of the Lord. The Bible says that we are like trees. We are like green olive trees in the house of the Lord for his glory. But when our consciences are not pure, they devour our ability to be fruitful and ultimately we are thrown out. May we not lose our reward in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to encourage you. The Bible says be of the company of those that press forward unto the saving of the soul. No matter where people are going, no matter how attractive they make it seem, no matter how justified it seems on their mouths, in their words, look at the fruit. Are they falling or are they standing? And choose to stand with the ones who are holding on to the cross until they bleed out the life of man to get the life of Christ. Sprinkle your conscience from evil thoughts. And the Bible says in verse 23, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Stir up what? Love and good works. Don't try to raise people against people that you're against. It is called cowardice. Be ashamed of yourself. If you are not man enough to fight somebody, then don't poison other people's mind against them. The moment that you're not man enough, give it up already. The Bible says when your strength fails in the day of adversity, is indeed weak. Don't pollute your children against your spouse. Don't pollute your siblings against your mom. Don't pollute other people against the pastor. Simply because you don't... The reason why you're doing that is because you're not able. And God is not equipping you to be destructive. Stir up love, not hate. Thank you, Lord Jesus, because of the fact that I have this privilege. By the grace of God to speak the truth. So that their blood will not be on my hand only tomorrow they will have their reward their recompense and the Bible says <laughs> not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some but exhorting one another so much so as we see the day approaching I know that I have belabored you today by proving to you that the war that is going on in the Ukraine between the rulers of the world, between the Vladimir and the Volodymyr, that war is the same war that Paul says that you need to watch out for. Because when that destruction be begins, then you can expect the coming of the Lord. It will be as a thief in the night to the people that are not watching and praying. I know that I have belabored you a lot today with many details. But the reason why I did all of that is because the Holy Spirit said to me, He said, I want Hebrews 10.25 to make sense to them that as they see the day approaching, they need to ensure that they stay in fellowship regardless of what it takes. Do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves, of the saints. Don't just gather with people running a club for social activities. But be in the place where the coming of the Lord Jesus is being preached. Where the gospel of remembrance is held high. Where people are anticipating great deliverance that will come through great tribulation. Be in the company of those who are not looking to escape, but the ones who are looking to overcome. Because as you see the day approaching, that is your responsibility to yourself. So that you are not given to deceit. And so that you are not given to flattery. So that you can say, I know God. I do exploits in his name
It wasn't the people that made billions that became like the stars of the heavens. It wasn't the people that raised a following of 100,000, 100 million people. It wasn't the people that sold the best sellers in books. The Bible says it was the ones that won a soul. And that is what we have decided to do. And if it costs us the world, we're okay with it. Simply because this world is perishing anyway. We will give it up to receive the new one that is eternal. Let me tell you something. Do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. It will cause for you to expose yourself to the Holy Spirit for the sprinkling of your heart of evil conscience. It would allow for you to be in humility, dedicated to the Lord, seeing to the exhortation of other people. When we come together, the Bible says those things and it, and it was rounded up by the solution that do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves. Isolation is Satan's strategy for consumption, for destruction. But when you find a place where the Lord has put his name and you find people who are gathered in his name not because of the money that they will make or the t-shirts that they will sell or the real estate that they will do, you know, because we've seen people who only come to church so that they can tell you about the house they want to sell. But then we have people who actually sell plenty of houses here and I don't see them following people and telling them, oh, come and buy a house, come and buy a house. Antoine is a living witness. Today, I brought people to him today. I said, this person wants to buy a house. That person wants to buy. And he talks to them all the time, but he's not selling to them because when he comes here, he comes here in God's name. And God is blessing him. If we would trust God, he can do for us more than Satan is doing for the world. Who owns it all at the end of the day? Is it not your father? The Bible says he owns a cattle upon a thousand hills. And if he, did not, if he did not withhold Jesus from you, will he not together with him freely give you all things? Come here in his name, not because of what you're selling, not because of who you don't like, not because of who you want to impress or oppress. Come here in his name. Come here because you know that we are in the company of innumerable angels and that you will hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Communion house, it's a new day. And God forbid that we have to carry people out like Ananias and Sapphira. Because it happened then so that we can learn how to comport ourselves ahead of the power. Because that power is inevitable. You know the guarantee that we have that the power is inevitable? The trials are inevitable. And so when we see the trials, and they have already begun, we're already being uh, persecuted. <laughs> by the ones that once called us brothers. And Jesus said it, he says, it, they are the ones who once called you their brother that will begin the persecution. He says, but don't worry, as they did to me, so shall they do to you, that you may have eternal life, that you may be a carrier of the glory of God. And so what else are we waiting for? We'll go ahead and sprinkle our conscience of our hearts of evil conscience, so that when Lucifer comes, he doesn't find anything within us. When he comes, let his magnet not be able to pick up any heaviness of metal in you that is made up of unforgiveness, of strife, of bitterness. When he comes, let your heart and your conscience be clean as a whistle, doing nothing but giving glory to God and singing to the exhortation of other people. Let me remind you, when God called my wife and I to start this work, he said one thing to us. He said, I'm inviting you to partner with me in seeing the light of others shine. Our commitment is to see your light shine, not to see you brought down, not to see you miss the way, but to see you become that light that Daniel saw at the appearing of the Lord. Let us eat and drink. We receive the bread as the Lord's body and take the wine as his blood in remembrance of him as he has commanded. And let it be unto us today the revival of our commitment to love and the cleansing of our hearts of any evil conscience that we may be able to prove that which is good, that which is acceptable, and that which is the perfect will of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may eat and drink. Hallelujah. We're, we're wrapping up and um, who's coming, whoever is coming next, be ready. I just want to quickly read to us from 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. 1 John 
chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible says, and I want you to listen because these are the last days. Every word now becomes even more precious. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from sin. Let me read this again, folks. Now, I want to preface this scripture again with this preamble. I'm going to preface it with this. Um, is that, is that Rema in the corner there? Wow, God is good. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, and I, and I tell you, I see you bigger than you are. And so I want to encourage you, be ready for God to grow you in this season. In the knowledge of the things of God to increase your stature in the realm of the spirit. Aspire to pray in tongues more than any one of your mates. The Lord has given you the gift. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. So that when that one comes that would seek to take advantage of you, they will find you bigger than them. They will find you stronger than them. They will find you unapproachable. Simply because the one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. The Bible says in here, and, I, and the preface is this, this is an express word. You see, I want you to take this to heart as seriously as when I give you a prophecy about what's about to happen in the world. Remember when I told you about the great royalty that was going to pass away to begin the order of change in the world. And three days later, the queen passed. When I told you that the war was going to begin in the Ukraine and a couple of weeks later we started, that kind of seriousness, when I told you that a bank was going to be taken over by the same people who actually were running the bank but tell you that it was taken over because it was failing. You see, that kind of seriousness is what I want you to please attach to this scripture that I am reading to you. This is not just the letter. This is the spirit. And when it says to you, walk in his light. He's also letting you know how this thing plays out. The word of God says here, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. The blood of Jesus is doing a cleansing for those who are in fellowship with one another. Please do not break ranks. Do not break fellowship break bread. God bless you. Come in your house. God is good. Does anybody know that when God says a thing, it's forever? When Satan says something, it's temporary. I want to speak to you all today. Uh, this is something I've been wanting to share for some time now. A couple of weeks ago, pastor uh, prophesied uh, over me and um, something that would happen that was really peculiar. And um, I just want to share it with y'all because it came to pass. Um, so if you know me, I, yeah, praise, praise God. If you know me, I have, uh, I love golf and I have a page that's kind of dedicated to my love for sneakers and golf. And pastor prophesied that I would have somebody comment on one of my posts and it would, it would ignite something in my spirit where I would share the gospel and a scripture with that person. And he said that in this particular instance, there were seven angels involved that would make sure that God gets the glory and that things would work out the way they should. So obviously, praise God. So obviously the entire week, after that, I was on alert. I've never looked at any, every, every single comment, every single DM, just truly like searching like, oh, I'm ready. And so finally, Spirit was like, check with Pastor Moses. Just let him know kind of what's going on. Just see, what, see if there's anything you need to know. So I, so I say, Pastor, is there some wording I'm looking for? Like what, what is, what is going to catch my eye? He was like, Pastor, look me, or he didn't look me in the eye. He told me over the phone. He goes, he goes, your spirit will know. It'll just come to you. I'm like, okay. Sure enough, two days later, 
this gentleman comments on my post. So the post was about, I had won a giveaway with some golf irons. So I was super excited to share it with everybody. And so I was just kind of telling the specs and stuff of the irons or the golf clubs that I won. So this guy chimes in and he goes, um, <laughs> he goes, uh, who's your agent? And right then and there, my spirit just said, oh yeah, yeah, you already know what to do. So I said, so I said, Jesus Christ is my agent, Philippians 4.19. And if you know, in Philippians 4.19, it says, and my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so upon further investigation, after I said that, I said, let me, let me see what the comment is back. And so the comment back was praise God, glory, be, you know, just, just all the praises back. So I said, let me, let me see who this person is. I click on their profile. Lo and behold, it's a man of God at Victory Midtown Church. And so he, he had been following me for some time and it was just awesome to see. I could tell by his response that that was something that he needed to hear. So I just wanna let you know, God is definitely moving in this place. God is good. And I just wanted to share that with y'all to stay encouraged and just know that God has you here for a reason and God is working in all of our lives and he's great and just awesome. So, so thank you, Pastor, for always giving us his word and keeping us on point. All right, I'm fired up now. I, look, I need a sermon, can I? No. <laughs> All right, y'all. So let's get into these tithing and offerings. We've got the giving details on the screen here. Uh, we've got uh, also Brother Kenyatta has the basket along with the envelopes. Um, as far as the online, we've got www.communion.house forward slash give. We've also got the Cash App and Zelle and PayPal details as well. So take your time here. Everybody, please bow their heads and close their eyes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for just putting purpose and life in each and every one of us, Lord. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit continues to guide us and just lead us to glory and allow us to go from glory to glory as your word says, Father. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings and just bless everybody in this building. Allow us to be a witness as to just how powerful you are and how great you are, Lord, and just bringing others to Christ so we can be that light that you want us to be. And you can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Father, we just thank you. Thank you for the communion and the congregation of saints, and we just thank you for being so awesome. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, everybody. When Chris, met, when Chris said that his phone was attached to his body, he was not lying. We had to, but I'm glad you got she that. Probably, she probably say that all the time. Oh, well, <laughs> let's move on. Let's move on on that note. Family dinner and teaching, Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Um, please join us for some um, good food and some wonderful fellowship before service on Tuesdays. It's always a good time. We have Second Watch, a time of prayer. Yes, Brother Allen has been definitely um, a time of prayer in the spirit, building up our most holy faith. That is Wednesdays at 9 p.m. at Communion House on Instagram. Has setting an alarm helped anybody else other than, yes, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Alarms are where it's at. Um, say that one more? Mm, no, it's okay. I'll just use my 2020. Worship gathering Saturdays back at it, um, 6.30 p.m. 
here on Saturdays. Are we able to get, are, is it okay, all right. Well, um, last but not least, yes. So we're having some technical difficulties, but I'm happy to say that the Helpers on Watch Women's Breakfast is on. Yes, thank you guys, come on, thank you. I'm glad y'all had a good time this morning, but you wait until next, next Sunday, February 4th at 11 a.m. Um, the women will be getting together and we're just, it's gonna be a great time. It's gonna be a wonderful time. So if you need more information, please let me know. Pastor Rosemary, anybody, um, we'll fill you in on those details. So with that being said, uh, Chris, are you gonna lead second service in the lobby? <laughs> Always. Always, all right. We'll meet you guys for uh, second service in the lobby. Have a great night. Praise God.